Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the WOW History Channel. In this episode, we're going to explore George Washington, one of my favorite historical subjects. The information is going to come from a book in 1858. The book is entitled, The National Portrait Gallery of Distinguished Americans. This book contained biographical sketches and fine engraved portraits of hundreds of Americans, some famous, others not so famous, some you'll know, and others who will be unfamiliar. The reason I chose this book is because it gives us an idea of the author's thoughts on people like George Washington in 1858. As I read through this rather lengthy biography, you'll see what the author thought was important and what was left out, how they viewed Washington in the context of the American Revolution and the founding of America, what character traits were important, etc. The book is obviously pro-American and designed to show the individual subjects in their best light. However, the vocabulary and grammar that was used then is far different than that used today. I mean, you read a sentence and you sort of have to think about it for a second or two to really understand what's being said. As I read through the text, I'll occasionally break in with a comment or two to help with your understanding but I'll be careful to identify those breaks so as not to confuse. I hope you'll stay for the whole ride because I think you'll really enjoy it and you'll definitely get a better idea of what George Washington was like. So close your eyes and let's go back to 1858 and meet George Washington. Our Commonwealth possesses no richer treasure than the fair fame of her children. In the revolutions of empires, the present institutions of our land may perish, and new ones, perhaps more perfect, may arise. But the glory of our national existence cannot pass away so long as the names of those who, in it, enlarged the boundaries of knowledge, gave tone to its morals, framed its laws, or fought its battles, are remembered with gratitude. The men who stamp the impressions of their genius or their virtues on their own times influence also those which follow, and they become the benefactors of after ages and of remote nations. Of such the memorials should be carefully collected and preserved, and Americans, above all others, owe it to their country and to the world to perpetuate such records while it is possible to separate truth from fiction in all that relates to those who laid the foundation of the Republic, who have sustained it by their wisdom and adorned it by their talents. It should be constantly borne in mind that our country stands conspicuous among nations as a fair daughter amidst a family of elder sons, that as a nation it has passed through no age of fabulous obscurity nor useless years of feeble infancy, but stepped forth at maturity in the panoply of war, like Minerva from the brain of Jove. In its history there is no blank. It is full of striking incidents, of original theories, and of bold experiments. In its government it has exhibited, and is still demonstrating to the world, under new and peculiar aspects, the ability of men to rule themselves and to protect their own rights without injury to the rights of others. The men whose names are inscribed with honor on the pages of American history were fitted to the times and the occasions which called them forth. They were men of iron nerves and fearless hearts, of devoted action and incorruptible integrity, of splendid talents and practical common sense who lived for the glory of their country and the happiness of their race. Of these, there is one, quote, first in the hearts of his countrymen, end quote. Here I'll take the first break, because what follows is a short little poem by an author identified only as Pollock, P-O-L-L-O-K, where he writes, quote, The first in every public duty, conspicuous like an oak of healthiest bough, deep-rooted in his country's love he stood, end quote. And apparently this was a reference to, of course, George Washington. 
So I'll get back to the text. George Washington was born at Bridges Creek, Westmoreland County, Virginia, on the 22nd of February, 1732. Before he was 10 years old, he was deprived of the guidance and example of an excellent father, but the judicious economy and prudent affection of his remaining parent provided for him instruction in the useful branches of knowledge, and above all, she trained him to a love of truth and successfully cultivated that high moral sense which characterized his actions from his youth. There is no doubt that to the careful culture bestowed by his affectionate mother, the goodness and greatness of Washington are to be ascribed. And we will here call the attention of the reader to the fact, which bears honorable testimony to the female character, that a large proportion of the distinguished men whose names adorn the history of our country were left to the care of their widowed mothers at a very early age. And again follows another poem, this time by a Mrs. Sigourney. Quote, This tells to mothers what a holy charge is theirs, with what a kingly power their love might rule the fountain of the newborn mind, warns them to wake at early dawn, and sow good seed before the world doth sow its tares. End quote. Back to the text. At the age of 15, Washington received the appointment of midshipman in the British Navy, but surrendered it at the earnest desire of his mother. He afterwards practiced the profession of a surveyor, and when 19, he held for a short time the appointment of adjutant general with the rank of major in the forces of the colony. In 1753, the French began to execute a project they had some time meditated which was to connect their Canadian possessions with Louisiana by a line of posts from the lakes to the mouth of the Ohio. They marched a force into the country and erected a fort on the Allegheny River, but these measures being regarded as encroachments on the rights of Great Britain, the Lieutenant Governor of Virginia, Dinwiddie, determined to require their withdrawal and selected Washington for the performance of the hazardous enterprise of traversing the wilderness and making the demand. This journey was performed in the depth of winter. On his route, he examined the country, noted the strongest military positions, secured the friendship of the Indian tribes, and made himself acquainted with the force and designs of the French. On his return, he presented a journal of his progress and observations as part of his report, which being published and extensively circulated was read with interest in all the colonies and gave him a prominent place in the regard of the public. As the French were determined to hold the country west of the mountains, the legislature of Virginia began to take measures for the maintenance of the British claim. They accordingly raised a regiment and appointed Washington lieutenant colonel. Early in the spring, he marched with two companies in advance to the Great Meadows, where he learned from some friendly Indians that the French had attacked and dispersed a party of workmen who were erecting a fort on the southeastern branch of the Ohio and were themselves building a fortification at the confluence of the Allegheny and Monongahela and that a detachment were on their march towards him, apparently with hostile intentions. These he surrounded in their encampment at night and at break of day his troops, after delivering one fire which killed the French commander, captured the whole party except one man being joined soon after by the residue of the regiment and a few other troops, making an aggregate of somewhat less than 400 men, they erected a small stockade fort. Here he was attacked by 1,200 French and Indians, and after a brave resistance from 10 in the morning until night, he capitulated. The Assembly of Virginia voted their thanks for the gallantry and good conduct displayed on this occasion. In the winter of 1754, Orders were received from England that officers of the royal troops should take rank over provincial officers of the same grade, without regard to seniority, and on this, Washington resigned his commission with indignation and withdrew to Mount Vernon. From this retirement, he was tempted by an invitation from General Braddock to serve as a volunteer aide-de-camp in the campaign of 1755. The experience and advice of Washington 
might have been peculiarly valuable to the general had he known its worth, but that officer, unused to the march of an army through the wilderness, refused to dispense with a cumbrous atterail or to adapt his mode of warfare to the state of the country. The consequence was his army was defeated and he lost his life. At this point, I had to look up the word atterail, which is spelled A-T-T-I-R-A-I-L. Atterail is a French word that means paraphernalia, equipment, outfit, and stuff. So what the author was trying to convey was that General Braddock refused to offload all that excess baggage, which made it difficult to move through the wilderness. And as a result, his army was defeated and General Braddock lost his life. Now, when we get back to the text, it starts out by saying, Notwithstanding the unfortunate results of the expedition, the bravery and admirable conduct of Washington in covering the retreat of the army received the recommendation of the wounded general and led to his appointment as commander-in-chief of all the Virginia forces. Nearly three years, with less than 1,000 provincial troops, aided occasionally by militia, he was expected to protect a frontier of near 400 miles in extent, but his force was inadequate to the duty required, and the distressed inhabitants of the frontiers either fled or fell before the savage foe, until the Blue Ridge became the boundary of settlement. In the expedition against Fort Duquesne in 1758, Washington served under General Forbes, and after a succession of arduous duties, when the country was relieved from immediate danger, he resigned his commission, to the great regret of the officers of the army, both British and provincial. They, who had seen service with him in the wilderness, knew the value of his experience and prudent counsels, and although it had been too humiliating to the pride of those who had gathered laurels in the fields of Europe to follow the advice of a provincial officer, yet in the judgment of his countrymen, he retired with an increased military reputation. From the fields of his early fame, he turned his attention to the peaceful pursuits of agriculture and the enjoyment of domestic life. Having inherited from his brother the Mount Vernon estate, he took possession of it and married a lady of whom we shall hereafter speak more particularly. The ensuing 15 years were chiefly passed on the banks of the Potomac in the improving of his estate occasionally exercising the functions of a justice of the peace or of a representative in the provincial legislature until the general congress first assembled in philadelphia like the years of early life we must pass too hastily forward to more momentous scenes to note the progress of this period more particularly although virginia had had her share of vexations which had at intervals agitated the colony nearly a century all had been forgotten on the approach of hostile feet. British and provincial blood had flowed together on the same field in the common cause, and by the union of American and British valor over the whole country, from the ocean to the northern lakes, the Union flag of Britain waved triumphantly. Peace and security brought joy and harmony to the people, and had the authority of the mother country received a liberal construction from its rulers, it is probable that the love and allegiance of the colonists might have been confirmed. But a spirit of domination prevailed and was resisted. Power was applied to enforce obedience, but it only aggravated the evil by embittering the spirits of a people who felt themselves to be no longer children and that as such they were not regarded. The principle contended for by the Parliament was the absolute, quote, power and right of Great Britain to bind the colonies in all cases whatsoever." End quote. Virginia was not less ready than the other colonies to contest that right, and the House of Burgesses declared that, quote, no power on earth has a right to impose taxes on the people or take the smallest portion of their property without their consent given by the representatives in Parliament, end quote. The parties were thus at issue, and the most zealous exertions were made to defend, quote, the American cause, end quote. When the first intelligence of the Boston Port Bill was received in Virginia, the legislature, which was then in session, entered a solemn protest against it on their journal and appointed the 1st of June, 1774, the day on which it was to go into operation as a day of fasting and prayer. 
I'll take a break here and discuss what the Boston Port Bill was all about. The official title of the Boston Port Act was, quote, an act to discontinue in such manner and for such time as are therein mentioned the landing and discharging, shipping of goods, wares, and merchandise at the town and within the harbor of Boston in the province of Massachusetts Bay in North America, end quote. The Boston Port Act was one of five measures that became known as the Intolerable Acts. In other words, the British colonists would not tolerate uh, these acts that were being imposed upon them by the British Parliament. The Intolerable Acts really pushed the American colonists over the edge, and this was when they first started thinking about independence as a reality for their future. So let's get back to the text. That day, referring to June 1, 1774, indeed throughout the country was a day of humiliation and mourning. Whilst engaged in these proceedings, they were hastily summoned by the governor to the council chamber and suddenly dissolved. The next day, the members met and recommended the appointing of deputies from the several colonies to meet in Congress to deliberate on the measures which the general interests required. Deputies were accordingly appointed, and Congress assembled in Philadelphia on the ensuing 4th of September. One of these deputies was George Washington. The conspicuous part he had borne in the late wars had indicated him as the most competent person to be placed at the head of the independent companies formed in Virginia. And when he took his seat in the General Congress, he was regarded as the soldier of America. He was appointed on all committees in which military knowledge was requisite, and when it was determined to appoint a commander-in-chief, he was unanimously chosen. He accepted the appointment with great diffidence and declined all compensation beyond the payment of his expenses. This is a great point at which to end this podcast. George Washington has just been named the Commander-in-Chief of all American forces. In the next podcast, we'll hear about how Washington began his campaigns against the British. Remember, the colonists were trying to expel the British from America at the same time that the British were trying to quell the rebellion. Obviously, we all know that the Americans won, but there were a few times that Washington and the American army were almost defeated. Stay tuned for the next exciting installment of the 1858 story of George Washington. If you like this channel and wish to learn more, please subscribe and leave a comment. Your support is very much appreciated. Until next time, this is Ron Guth signing off.